G'day folks and welcome to this overview and example of play of Crown of Roses. This is a two to four player war game focused on uh, the War of the Roses, 15th century England, designed by Stephen Coyler and published by GMT Games in 2012. This is a pretty heavy uh, war game. It brings together various elements of war game design that were particularly prominent in the 2000s and early 2010s. So it is, uh, gameplay revolves around the card driven system. At the start of each turn, you'll be dealt a hand of five cards, plus you may have available, depending on the scenario, a hand of house cards, which you can draw upon. Uh, plus you may be dealt extra cards based on control of certain areas, holding certain offices and so forth. There are four different scenarios in the game, uh, two four-turn scenarios and two nine-turn scenarios representing different uh, aspects, different eras in the, the, the War of the Roses. Um, it is a game for two to four players and each of these scenarios provides sort of scope to play with just two or three or four and the rules can be modified slightly. You play effectively a a house, such as the House of Lancaster or the House of, of York, uh, vying for, I guess, control of, of the realm. Uh, there are, in the base game, the rules is written, there were three ways to achieve victory, basically a, uh, I think it's called a military victory or a political victory. A military victory is where you gain control of spaces, particularly your enemy home spaces. A political victory is where you gain control of basically the political situation. You're, you've been king for five turns or you control the bulk of the nobles on the board. In the original game, there was scope for an economic victory where you gain victory points by doing various things, but that's been kind of added as an optional rule or, or suggested to kind of use as an optional rule in the revised rules uh, because too many people were trying to pursue that, um, that, that objective. So yes, card driven, but also featuring blocks and your blocks principally represent the nobility of the realm they are sort of individuals in their their armies but they can be supplemented by holding various uh, offices or, or sort of titles in the realm uh, they can be boosted by certain allies like the burgundians or the french uh, or i think the scots are here as well um yeah and so being a, a a card driven game you for those of you familiar with card driven games you get dealt that hand of card and uh, cards and you can use these cards typically either for ops and spend these points to do things or for the event and in which case you'll just follow the event out the events are fascinating in this game they feature pirate raids uh, local rebellions uh, plagues uh, various things that do things to various nobles there's the plague, the various allies that come out, and you put these into play, and you can use them for, for options, I guess, at various times. Um, so a lot of dynamic elements. Now this is uh, a game that was originally sort of based on Stephen's attempt to develop Kingmaker, and along the way he kind of added these elements to really transform the game. Uh, by quite a lot. So it's still being based on the War of the Roses, being based on Kingmaker, it has echoes of Kingmaker, but it, it truly is a very different game. A lot of these things like the plague, like the writs, like the officers moving the armors around, they, they feel, or well, they're reminiscent of Kingmaker, but gameplay really does become quite different. And it, and it uh, yeah, the, the rules are very different to Kingmaker. Speaking of the rules, so we've got 48 pages of rules. Aside from the first page, which is the, the contents page, the first 17 or 18 odd pages of those are dedicated towards explaining the components. This is explaining the different information on the different types of blocks, the different types of events that you'll encounter, event, surprise, ally. There are air cards, um, and mandatory event cards and explain all these different things, explaining the different symbols on the map uh, as well. So you'll notice we have a block game. It is divided into area sort of act, uh, areas of activation called shires. Within each shire, we have the, uh, the home estate heraldry, which shows basically the, the home regions for various nobles. So you can see uh, these nobles over here have rather these two symbol, uh, Heraldic symbols here can be the home region for these two nobles. Um, 
Gloucester and uh, and Buckingham over here can be the home region for those nobles. You also have uh, a, a shire um, value, a number, and sometimes if they're not black, they'll have a shire loyalty, like blue or red or white or yellow. What this basically means is that Leicester and Rutland, for example, are loyal to the House of York, whereas Pembroke out in West Wales is loyal to the House of, of Lancaster. Uh, and this is important because control of these shires gives you influence points. It tells you how many troops you can raise in that shire, um, how many dice are rolled for planned uprisings and various plague events, um, and also the stacking limit of that shire. So, yes, you're trying to control these shires. That's part of the military victory. In particular, you're trying to control enemy home shires, um, coded the colour of your enemy. Um, but you're also trying to gain nobles and, and gain these additional shires that are, that are black, that are effectively um, neutral. So, yeah, you'll notice that many of these are shared as well. So multiple nobles could have to share the same home shire. There's, of course, London here with the London garrison, which benefits the, the defender. Uh, with your activations, so you'll, you'll play a card for ops. And typically, I guess the most common thing you probably want to do is move your armies around. So you'll look at um, your nobles. And Warwick has a very high noble rating. Four is the maximum. And uh, this tells us sort of the rank of that noble, the noble rank. You have a four here, a great leader versus Scrope here, who has, is a very low leader. And armies have to be commanded by the best available leader. So Warwick must command Scrope. Scrope cannot command Warwick, for example. The number in the left tells us how many other armies they can command. So you can command two other forces. Scrope can command one. And, of course, they can have attachments, office attachments, such as Warwick being the captain of Calais or York being, here we are, the lieutenant of, of Ireland. These officers uh, represented by or, or detailed in these offices, office cards give additional military forces, just like the original Kingmaker. They also come with additional influence points, votes and support and sometimes special abilities as well. Uh, so you'll have these officers attached to these individuals who hold the office and they'll help them move around the map and wage warfare. And then at the end of a turn, you do a, uh, I think it's called the, the office phase, uh, where these are all sort of redistributed again. And you'll see right at the top of the map there, the, the role of parliament, which gives an indication, it's a bit hard to see from way back here, but it gives an indication of who holds uh, the various titles and yeah what is what is available so you can see on the left here the treasurer office is vacant whereas all other offices for this scenario are held at the start of, of gameplay uh, there's an indication down here of popular support and that confers additional benefits more influence more votes more card draws during the turn uh, this is color coded for york and lancaster this is set up for a two-player game we have the turn track uh, every turn there'll be a number of impulses equal to uh, the lowest hand count among the players. Uh, it might be five if they're just drawing the bare minimum of five or six or seven if they're drawing um, bonus cards. Uh, yes, as I said, so you're moving around. You have a base movement of four. It typically costs your armies one movement point to cross these borders. If they're moving from, a, from one area into a friendly area, they halve that, so that would just be half a movement point. Uh, if they're crossing this dark border, it costs two movement points. There are a few special movement areas across here, uh, treacherous waters and the fens over here, which are slightly more dangerous. They require uh, attrition rolls. And there are also options for force marches. So once you've moved your four spaces, you can move one additional space at some cost, an attrition roll. I mentioned plagues, say plague areas, and they you place these plague markers and they'll hurt armies caught out in those areas and after the effects are done the region becomes devastated by the effects of the plague there uh, there is sea movement as well so you can move across these sea zones we've got the english channel the irish sea and the north sea up here there's france off to the the southeast ireland up in the west and then scotland up in the north uh, which you can move across land to get there or use a sea move you can muster new forces so during combat uh units may take step losses and you can rebuild these over time. 
there is, I've mentioned influence. So you gain influence points throughout the game and you'll spend these influence points basically to influence noble. This represents both, I guess, political influence and I might also say economic influence. You'll place these on specific nobles face down to try to influence them to your cause. And these are resolved later uh, during the influence phase, but it's kind of like a secret bidding. You're bidding on these sort of nobles to try and get them to join you. Uh, and yeah, multiple players will be placing these IPs without exactly knowing. Uh, and of course, you do have these bluff markers. So I could, for example, place a heap of bluff markers on a noble. My opponent might think I'm really bidding for this, but uh, yeah, I'm bidding nothing. Uh, what else is there? So yes, movement, combat, you're rolling um, dice based on the armies in a battle um, as shown on the different colours. Red is best, blue is second best, green is the worst. They hit on different um, die results. Uh, yeah, there's. it's interesting. So this is, I mean, the, the idea of a block system, it's based kind of uh, most popularised by the Columbia Games blocks. Columbia Games are famous, I think, also for their relatively short rule books, eight pages many of their games have. But in this game, the rules for combat alone stretch to eight plus pages because it includes things like very special rules for special nobles and effect, uh, the, the, the effects of after combat and um, all these kind of things. So this game takes all of those elements and kind of steps it up a notch. It's a card-driven system, but with added complexity. Um, it uses a basic hand of cards, but you have quite a long impulse compared to um, other multiplayer card driven games and i'm thinking probably of here i stand here um you have you vote for king as well so your faction will have a number of votes and you'll have a negotiation with other players and kind of elect the king uh and that's being king is a path for victory if you can be king for five turns it's uh yeah possible you'll achieve a political victory there's a wintering phase all the armies return home and then they are all redistributed again um and uh yeah i'm really condensing 48 pages into a couple of minutes but folks that is crown of roses i'll be playing through this and reporting more on, on how it goes and telling you a little bit more about this game so uh stay tuned if that appears to be of interest and as always thanks for watching